everyone. You might remember how during our adventures in Revendreth, we ran into Najia the Misplayed, the finest duelist that has ever wielded a sword. She was locked up in the Endmire, where we set her free. Once more, she finds herself in chains due to Tha's master Matthias. Again, he has used her sinstone against her, and he has his dredgers work around the area, searching for more leverage over the other Van Veer. As we saw during questing, in Revendreth, knowing someone's real name and past sins, it gives you a certain power over them. The Taskmaster is quite invested in getting as much of that knowledge as he can. We search around the place to figure out what exactly he's doing here, and we find some of the sinstones ourselves. What really stands out for me is that it seems like there's no global judging system. There's no set of rules that applies to each and every soul presented to the Arbiter. Instead, it appears to depend on the laws of the reality of the world that you come from. A good example is the Chip Sinstone, accounting of all the false sins of Gorkar Skullcrusher, Karg to the Ubret people of Zamgra, First Eagle of Zar, Cowards, who hid from battle rather than fighting against the enemies of his clan, Liar, who befouled the ways of Zar with his deceits and mockery of the truth. Traitor, who negotiated a peace in return for being a puppet carg for the invaders to use against his own people. And Singer, who raised his voice to the heavens in violation of the laws of the Ubrets. It would be kinda hard to place the same sins upon a soul that hails from Ezra, for example. So as long as the Taskmaster holds Najia's sinstone, he's gonna have power over her and she won't stand much of a chance against him. Time to set up a little trap by inviting him over for a poison drink. We join him in a toast as he's quite excited to meet the fabled Mallwalker. If it's true that we're able to freely travel these lands, then we have access to certain information that he cannot reach. Information which translates into power and prestige. But before he knows it, the poison takes effect. Najia, or should we say Viscountess Ikle of Escaron, premier of the Order of Blades as she was known in life. She has her sinstone again, and she wants Matthias to kneel and apologize or they shall duel. He is not going to kneel for someone like her. So we get the solemn duty of being her second for the coming fight. She doesn't know the code in our homelands, but in hers, it will be our task to secure the field, offer any of these sinstones that we found to his followers. Perhaps having control back will make them see reason and step to the side. Those that do not, those that are unable to do so, they will find their true death. And at the top of Witherfall Ruin, their duel commences. And of course, the Taskmaster doesn't fight fairly. His stonebound guardians are animated to join the fight. So it's only fair that we do as well. She would have let him get away with a simple apology, but... Ah well, Taskmaster Matthias chose his own fate. At Dredgewood, they show us how the dredgers are made. You might have seen the cute owl boys back in Bastion. The dredgers, their revendress variation upon it. Born from muck pools, infused with plenty of filth and fiber to grow them effectively. But right now, it's all out of order. The anima shortage taking its toll once again. With the Vowders on the attack and the untreated muck forming its elementals. We go about tossing some of the filthy rubble into the pool to restore its properties. Then we dig up a gem of binding. That, combined with a bunch of dredgers and the powers of the pool, their powers combined, it turns them into a biggin. Not the brightest of the bunch, but powerful enough to smack the devourers around, shut down their rifts, and slay chartoks. An interesting side note is that you can get a dredger follower from the Tower of Torgust with their very own sinstone. Stonehuck the sinstone hurler. They love to hurl their sinstone. The smears of flesh and crackle of bone cause them to cackle with joy as their foes buckle under the weight of their prior crimes. At first, I thought that he just found someone else their sinstone to smack his enemies around with. But that crime line, it makes it seem like this was a dredger, judge worthy of carrying their own sinstone, repent for their sins. Such a naughty, naughty dredger. Now the Tithe Lords, they have a tight grasp on the Tithes of Darkhaven. And despite the entire country suffering under the Anima droughts, they won't hear any complaints. It doesn't really matter where it's going to come from, as long as the town still delivers their Anima, be it picked up from the ground, sucking poor tormented souls beyond the point of redemption, or sacrificing it out of their very own bodies. It doesn't matter, as long as the Anima flows, not helped by the loss of their Tithe convoy. Lajos is quite suspicious about the attack. They believe that they have a traitor right here in the village. 
we snoop around a bit for them. We try to see if their suspicions are correct. And Ilka and Samu, they have been overheard arguing. And a coded message indicating that the Tithe was going to be sent out soon is dug up. There's plenty of proof for a proper standoff, yet still, they refuse to confess. Lajos doesn't need any more proof when they got the clever instincts. The confrontation, it quickly escalates, with all parties drawing their weapons, all of them dead in an instant over accusations. And as it turns out, there was a traitor amongst them, yet it was none of the three that brought a swift end to their own story. As we party through Revendreth, still blissfully unaware of the Nephrius' true loyalties, we remove the accuser and then replace her with Lord Chamberlain. Under his devoted loyalty to the Master, their sacred rituals to help souls atone for their sins, they've all been perverted. The accuser, now our ally, she shows us how it's supposed to be done. Displays a proper ritual of absolution. It's not a kind or easy ritual, but atoning for one's sins never is an easy process. After all rituals of absolution are complete, each soul must then face their final judgment with three potential verdicts. If proven unworthy, if they're unable to atone for their sins, then they're condemned to the maw for all of eternity. But if they're fully absolved of their sins, it will either be elevated to a Vinfir, or they can return to the Arbiter back at Ouroboros to be assigned a new destination within the Shadowlands. It is their most sacred ritual, and one of them is happening right now. While disguised, we witness how the judgment happens under Lord Chamberlain's command, and once again, it's all perverted and wrong. The soul presented before them is one the accuser is intimately familiar with. She knows it has spent millennia atoning for all of their sins, but the others, they condemn it to the maw anyways. A mockery of their sacred ritual. She can't just remain at the sides hidden, let them do whatever they want. She steps in to sire this soul herself, binding hers to Kronoid Valigri and attest to their worthiness to be made into a Venfeir. Their fate and that of the accuser are now one and the same. Inquisitor Trajan can't undo this even if he wants it. Feligri is granted the status of Enfir and their new eternal name. They will be known as Grezit. But as for you, accuser, I will not forget your vow or the vulnerability it creates. She sacrificed a whole lot to save this single soul. And she would do so again, because it's the right thing to do. It's their sacred charge. Revendreth, it might be a realm of penance and torment, but it's done with a purpose beyond just feeding the jailer and the sire. There's actually a chance at redemption for those willing to take it. And the accuser, she remembers what they're here for. And she's not the only one either. Despite what we witnessed here, some steadfast Venfeir, they do still remain within these halls. Those who have not forsaken their vocation and carry on with their calling. Archivist Vein is one such as these. The archivist maintains strict records of every soul that passes through these halls. Or at least they're supposed to. The Sin Stones of powerful Venfeir, they tend to go missing, like the one of Inquisitor Tryon. He might have stolen it, or somebody could be hoarding it as blackmail. Either way, we need to get some sinstone records from the crypto filers within the area. With it, he'll be able to complete his archives and we'll get any sinstones that we need. Then we just need someone to use the sinstone, like we did before when we fought against the accuser. Our old friend Zemo will be perfect for the job and Cryptkeeper Kassir thankfully holds no grudges about that one time that we kicked the absolute crap out of him. Yet, he can't give us Temel though. The Lord Chamberlain deemed Temel a threat to his control. His folks have bashed him into bits and scattered the pieces amongst these crypts. Nothing that a bit of anima can't fix though. So after gathering the sinstones and putting Tamil back together, we're ready to confront Inquisitor Traia, or as he was known in life, Palaval the Biased, who squandered his unparalleled intellectual gifts, who made judgment from his perspective alone, who was slow to admit error and quick to accuse it. We will be able to obtain more sinstones in the future. Hunt down more of these corrupted Inquisitors for the achievements, it's always Sinny and Revendreff. For now though, a significant threat to the Accuser has been taken care of, and good old Grezit joins us back at Sinfall. That does still leave Lord Chamberlain to deal with. They're confronted within the Halls of Atonement, taking back that medallion of pride by force. A large step in their journey to reclaim the honor of these Halls, but certainly not the last. Now one little side quest that I do want to mention, but it's not connected to the overall achievements. It has to do with our best bud stone heads. 
getting into or out of the Ember Ward with him in the way, it's a bit annoying, as he will still pick you up and block your way. You can fix that by becoming best buds with him. To get close enough to grab this quest, you'll have to get the hollow rock behind him. Hidden from view, you can then get close to the chewed light shard and grab his quest. Rock's been busy today. Stonehead all he wants is some snacks, some gooey bug bites, some ash crisps, some mirror candy and a light snack picked up with a remnant of light. Gathering those materials, completing the quest, it gives you a whole different achievement. And from now on, Stonehead will leave you alone. And with access to the Ember Ward, we find Sabina tied up, unresponsive. Her exposed flesh cracked and blistered. Perhaps something with a pungent aroma will rouse it again, like pungent swarmer toxins. She doesn't know how long it's been since her captors left her here, but the light, it has definitely taken its toll. We can't just leave this poor vent for here to burn away in the light. So we look for the key in the rubble nearby. Her mind, it's already fading, unable to remember what has happened. The last thing that she can recall before things went dark is that she and her companions, they'd finally found refuge within the shadows. We try to look for them, but we only find death. The tether journal mentions that they've yet to find sanctuary, though not for a lack of trying. They're all feeling the effects of the light, though Sabina, she seems to struggle the most. She hasn't been herself lately, often staring into the distance, repeating words. They need to find shelter soon, or they fear that she will turn to ash. That, in combo with the hilt of the stained dagger, being engraved with a monogram of the letter S. And that despite her claims of being robbed, the contents within the light satchel have not been disturbed. It should give you a pretty good clue as to what happened here. Sabina fell to the madness of the light, her companions paying the price. Freeing her, it was a mistake on our end, one that we'll have to rectify by putting her out of her misery. And further into the Ember Ward, we find someone not too far gone. Lawrence, Mirror Maker to the Master, they ended up here by accident. While using one of the magical mirrors to travel on royal business, the mirror, it sent them to this wasteland instead. Not a moment after he arrived, a band of exiles ripped the clothes right from his back, which makes it impossible to traverse this unforgiving terrain. We grab his gear back and we keep an eye on things while he gathers up his mirror shards. Up ahead, he finds something quite shocking. His good friend Simone is trapped between three mirrors, all redirecting that awful light right into her. The Nephrius is kicking out anyone that he even suspects of betrayal, even his loyal servants like Simone, to suffer here within the Ember Wards. Clearly, he isn't the master that he used to be. So, after saving others that are trapped here, putting down those that are too far gone, Laurent decides that he can't return to his old position. Instead, he's gonna join us at Sinfall, but leaving the Amber Ward is easier said than done. The Nephrius stone servants will shatter anything that so much as glints. We're gonna have to keep them safe, while Laurent uses the shards and the anima that we gathered to hook them up with our transports. This adds his knowledge and his skills to our little rebellion, which comes quite in handy. He can hook us up with easier transport across Revendreth. And later on in the Covenant campaign, those mirror-fixing skills of theirs, it allows us to enter Maldrexus for the final confrontation. That story I've covered in detail during the Covenant campaign videos, which is linked up on the channel. And for now, you're up to speed on the side quests that go down in Revendreth. So as always, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed this one. And until next time, see ya!